landscape will remain such that there will be enough competition to drive consumer value, to drive innovation, to drive investment. But a pessimist might look at this world and say, uh, none of that's going to happen. Uh, we're going to move to duopoly in uh, wireless, and we're going to move to a cable monopoly uh, in, on the wired side. There are certainly commentators who are already claiming that. Uh, and that's going to result in higher prices for consumers and less innovation and investment. Um, I can always say that over the last almost three years, uh, we spent an enormous amount of time and energy trying to drive towards the first of those visions uh, and to avoid the second of those uh, two visions. Uh, and uh, I look forward now in a different role, uh, watching the agency uh, continue uh, in that effort. Uh, it's an incredibly, uh, filled with incredibly talented people, uh, and I know they'll do their very best. Well, great. Thanks, Eddie. So I could ask you a lot of different questions, but let me maybe start with Spectrum, since you were talking about that. Um, I was uh, with somebody the other day, and um, uh, they had their laptop, and they had a little 4G data card, LTE data card, and and they said, oh, it's pretty fast. I said, well, how fast is it? I don't know. So I said, look, give me the machine. So we did Press a the app. We did speed <laughs> test. And uh, it was 26 megabits download. I was uh, blown away by how great that was. Now it's possible it just happened to be at the right cell at the right time. But it was amazing. Um, so clearly, this, is, uh, this has the potential to be a third uh, pipe, if you will. Um, but to get that, I think one of the things we talked about earlier, what surprised you that uh, you couldn't, couldn't anticipate, was even though you all anticipated the growth of, of uh, spectrum demand, you, you sort of undershot it, which everybody else did too, because it's been so amazing. So in the spectrum auction that's going to be coming up, um, what do you think, there's a lot of debate about that, and should, 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 should there be, should there be caps, should there be a certain type of, what do you think are the two maybe three most important things that the FCC has to do to get that right. Because you're trying to balance a lot of different things. You're trying to revenue maximize, which is counter to caps. Uh, you also want to make sure there's enough spectrum out there for enough competition. So how do you, how do you look at that? Uh, well, so I guess I would start by saying the statute tells uh, the agency not to revenue maximize. In fact, it's very explicit in Section 309, I believe it is, uh, uh, that, that while uh, you know, everybody understands in our current fiscal environment and just looking at the debate on the Hill, obviously money is not irrelevant um, by any means. But that um, driving the public interest uh, is not always the same as driving revenue maximization. I don't think in the spectrum uh, it, it, it possibly can be. Um, uh, you know, as the chairman, uh, I think, said in his CES speech, one of the reasons he wanted to have uh, less restriction on the flexibility of the agency was because the agency has the ability to now run a rulemaking process, which it's going to do, um, uh, and bring in the world's foremost experts on every one of the subjects you touched upon, get their opinions, weigh their opinions, uh, and try and craft smart policy. Um, clearly, there's got to be uh, an eye to competition. They're, they're just a, 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 that has been the substitute for regulation in you know since 1996, and so uh, uh, it's been an effective driver of, of all the things you want to drive, and uh, uh, so that's that's an important component of it. Whether that is uh, some kind of uh, spectrum screen or whether there ought to be caps or not, th th those are questions that actually that's why you run a rulemaking to figure out what is the best way to think about this. There's no doubt that every company needs more spectrum. It's not just you know, the smaller players. Um, so uh, that has to be taken into account and balanced in an appropriate way. Um, that's, so that's, that's one piece. And then I think another uh, really important question is the balance between unlicensed uh, and licensed spectrum. There again, Congress has uh, put in some provisions that, that uh, curb the flexibility of the agency. Um, but, uh, you know, what we've seen over the last uh, few years is the incredible importance of Wi-Fi. But Wi-Fi itself is getting congested. Uh, and so we're going to need new technologies to allow for the offloading uh, from the networks. It's become an incredibly valuable part of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, uh, so getting the balance right between license and unlicensed is the other component. So competition and, and, and license versus unlicensed. Not that they're unrelated. They're not totally separate. But uh, sure. those, I think, are two of the key issues to get right. So. 
if um, in a way you got to answer, it's hard to answer this with one number because you got to think about HHI concentration ratios. But is three an okay number, or do we are we are we sort of committed as an as a commission to four at least uh, from the chairman's view? Well, I don't I don't think there's necessarily a magic number, um, uh, and uh, uh, so I I'm. I couldn't possibly speak for the chairman with respect to whether three is the right number or four is the right number. I think uh, what you have to look to is the, is the activity in the marketplace. And are the competitors driving innovation in the way they're behaving? If you had four competitors, let's say, who behaved exactly the same in every respect, that actually wouldn't create the dynamic that you necessarily want. Um, what you need is a, is, a, is, is, is a marketplace in which consumers have good choice, uh, and there's enough of a competitive dynamic that the companies feel like they have to invest and they have to innovate to keep things going. I don't have the answer to what the right number is. Um, with, with re related to that, because I think one of the things that all often gets lost with competition policy in, in telecom is if we, we focus on the, the sort of the benefits of competition, which is correct. But sometimes we underestimate the cost of competition. So, for example, you could have 20 competitors in wireless. That's a completely inefficient market. In our view, you'd have too many competitors, not enough scale. So there's a sweet spot between sort of scale and efficiency and competition, and that's right. always what's being weighed. I mean, how do you look at that? I, I agree with that. I don't think, though, that there's any risk in the United States of having 20 significant wireless no, competitors. I mean, but, I, but your point is, is right, and the reason we don't is precisely for the scale reason. I mean, one of the other surprises that during our time, uh, at least it was a surprise to me, I mean, there may have been those who predicted this, is the way devices have started to drive the marketplace. Uh, you know, I guess the iPhone would be the example that's easiest to, to cite. I mean, Sprint paid $20 billion to get the iPhone. Um, and uh, that's a new dynamic uh, that I think affects the competitive landscape a lot. And one way it affects it is if you don't have scale, it's very difficult to get the device, devices you need to compete in the marketplace. So you're right, there is a balance. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that's something the commission is going to have to look at uh, constantly. But there's, you know, the, the general point you make is clearly, clearly right, that too many is, is inefficient, too few is also bad. Uh, there's a sweet spot there. Uh, and again, it depends on what are the competitors doing, not just one of the reasons, for example, T-Mobile, in that transaction, one of the things that the staff analyzed was, was T-Mobile something of a disruptor? And the answer came back yes, and that was an important part of the analysis uh, for why why the agency had a lot of concerns about that deal because it wasn't just taking a competitor out; it was taking a disruptive competitor out. Right. So one last question on Spectrum, which which um, has to be asked, um, and that's Light Squared. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess two questions there. One is. Um, would you have done anything differently uh, given what you know now has happened with Light Square? And, and the second one is, you know, what, what does that really mean, that, that process for reallocation? Because it's not like there's a lot of new spectrum out there. It's, it's going to, the future is about reallocation and moving from uh, in you know, lower use to higher uh, and better use, which is in theory what Light Square is doing. And, a lot of debate about were there were the receivers for the other the GPS receivers for the other folks not that not didn't have the right filters and all that but maybe we don't have to go into that but how do you see that what would what, what for you I'm sorry how would you have done that at all differently now light what uh, I don't know I never heard never heard of that company. never heard of it <laughs> um, so I, I don't I don't have a uh, uh, you know, looking back a moment in time when I think the agency um, should have done something different than it did. Uh, it ran a process uh, over a course of many years in which the interference concerns uh, that were ultimately raised uh, about GPS hearing signals inside the light squared spectrum weren't raised. Um, when they were raised, the agency put up a big red stop sign and said, uh, okay, we have a problem, uh, and until we figure out what the resolution of that problem is going to be, LightSquare is not going to be allowed to move forward. As a general matter, I think that process was the right process given what the agency knew when it knew it. Um, 
I think there are questions around why the problem didn't surface earlier. Uh, and it's worth taking a hard look and asking both ourselves inside, but also the parties outside the agency, you know, why, why did, is, you know, whether it's the FAA or DOD or the GPS industry itself, why, why didn't that come up in the earlier proceedings? But I don't really think the retrospective is all that important, and we ought to engage in a lot of time about that. It's a rather unique set of circumstances, I think. I think the real question is, here we have 40 megahertz of spectrum, a very valuable spectrum that the chairman was moving to, in essence, deregulate so that it could be used for more use. Uh, for, broad, for broadband use. Uh, and uh, it would be bad policy over the long run if that failed. Um, but, you know, life does not exist in six month or one year increments. It, it, it was a 10 year goal in the National Broadband Plan uh, to bring this spectrum online in addition to other spectrum to uh, meet the President's goal of 500 uh, megahertz. And uh, what's now got to happen is now that we know that there's this problem, we, we need to figure out something to do on the receiver standard side of things so that as the product cycles in the GPS uh, world move forward, uh, uh, over time, uh, this is a, from an engineering point of view, this is a fixable problem. It can't be fixed with all the devices that happen to be out there in a very, very short amount of time. Sure. It can be fixed over time. It needs to be fixed over time, and we need to get that spectrum online for other uses. Yeah, and that really begins to raise a whole new sort of set of questions about how we got the spectrum, that it's not just this free-for-all and kind of squat and interfere or not put develop with receivers. Right, and so if you ask me, you know, uh, well, why do we have an FCC? Uh, one answer, uh, at least a partial answer, is because spectrum management is really hard and really important, uh, precisely because uh, of the, inter among other things, the interference issues, the potential secondary market issues, all kinds of things where over time, we're going to need to get a great deal more oomph out of each megahertz of spectrum we have. And uh, that process will not just take place on its own. So let me switch gears. And, and uh, there, there was a period here in Washington where you, you really couldn't even go out and have lunch without somebody talking about net neutrality. <laughs> and I don't think I've heard the word for at least you know two months, So uh, and I, which I count as a blessing. It's a wonderful <clears throat> And I count as victory. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So let's talk about that victory. Uh, two things about it. One is um, the process. Yeah. And so I was looking online last night a little bit, and one of the things that came up was, uh, uh, which I remember, but I, I saw it again, was uh, how, uh, how, how vociferously you were attacked for having these closed-door meetings with the industry, but then you had closed-door meetings with the other side, too, and then they stopped it. Hopefully they stopped attacking you after. No, yeah. but that's okay. okay. So well, closed door meetings are only okay if they're with the you know, public interest groups. Uh, but, but um, so obviously that, that got resolved, um, but it didn't, it, it, in, in one sense, it, uh, there was a period there where you had this bicameral, bipartisan working group in the, in, in the House of the Senate that was sort of going, it sounded like perhaps in the direction of, of drafting a new legislation or, a, you know, a new title perhaps for, for the internet, which would have dealt with this, and then that fell apart, and then it came back to you, but then now with the Comcast case, it's, it's even debatable whether you might have authority, and what do you make of all of that? <laughs> in like one end. One I was going to say, how, how much time do we have? No. <laughs> um, so I, I guess try and break it down into its component parts. I mean, first of all, there's uh, there's the process, um, and the process actually started in a in a very um, I think uncon I won't say uncontroversial, but it's a very controversial topic, but in a typical fashion, which is we started rulemaking uh, in uh, I, I guess it was around. I'm just guessing, November of 2009, something around there. Um, and that was proceeding apace, and then the Comcast decision came down. Um, and, uh, you know, I think were it not for the Comcast decision, the decisional process for net neutrality would have been much more regularized. But there suddenly was a confluence of two difficult issues. One was this whole question of Title I, Title II, what classification should you use in light of the Comcast decision, as well as the already very controversial issue of so-called net neutrality itself. Um, and, and so I think that 
generated an especially large amount of, of heat around uh, the issue. But you know, when you when you when you were actually listening to the parties on both sides of the debate, I think both the chairman and I came away with the view that the that the bid and the ask, as he likes to put it, weren't that far apart. And that's what the generated that that's what generated those closed door meetings. It was an attempt to take some representatives from sort of the ISP community and some representatives from the tech and the public interest community, put them in a room, and let's see where we could get. You can't do that if you have 40 people in the room, or even 20 people in the room. So we chose six. And it was a calculated judgment that it was worth the pain of being criticized, knowing full well that in addition to the conversations that were being had in that room, I was having conversations with a million other people outside of the room to get their input. And I think, as painful as it was, it actually did drive the parties towards uh, a middle ground, not one that ever, you know, uh, 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 there were those who think the rules ultimately didn't go far enough, there are those who think they went too far, but a large group of the, uh, of the stakeholders have basically said, you know what, we can lay down our weapons, uh, demilitarize the issue of open internet. We actually all agree that open networks are important. Um, this is a high enough level framework that uh, uh, that that we can, that in the, with enough flexibility, that we can see how it plays out over time. And let's declare uh, uh, you know peace in our time. And I think that's largely what's happened. I think it's unfortunate that uh, there's this overhang of a court case. We don't know how that's going to come out. Um, uh, but I think by the time it is decided, the basic framework for open networks will be the cultural norm that all the, basically anybody who's not an outlier will be playing on. And that isn't to say there won't be disputes at the edges. But people basically understand what's expected. Plus Comcast will be under these conditions for seven years regardless of the court case. The, uh, uh, there are C-block conditions on the horizon, 700 megahertz spectrum. There's, there are lots of things that are conditioning the ecosystem to keep those networks open. And uh, while I wish it had all taken a lot less time and been a lot less fraught, um, I think, frankly, that the commission got to a pretty good place. So what, what are the implications in your mind if the Comcast decision says that you really don't have much authority here? Well, as I say, I think uh, because it will have become a cultural norm, it's not 100% clear what the outcome would be. I think it would present the commission with another difficult set of choices about one set of authority versus another set of authority. Um, I think that would be very unsettling and unfortunate, and why I hope the court won't do that. Um, uh, and uh, But at the end of the day, it's very, very important for the network, for the internet to remain open for reasons that I think everybody now recognizes. So um, uh, the result's more important than sure. the sausage making, and I and I think the result will, at the, at the end of the day, I think the norms that exist will continue to exist. So, um, you know, t I, we were talking earlier, and I, you know, I was commenting that you know, I, I mostly got involved in telecom policy in the, in the mid '90s, and back then it was it was sort of a technocratic walk fest. Um, it, 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 was, it wasn't super emotional, and I, in my view, something really fundamentally changed with net neutrality that that it, that it stopped becoming respectful, it stopped becoming a walk fest, and it, it really became embittered. Uh, there was distortions. Uh, uh, there was name calling. And uh, which to me was a very disconcerting view that you can't make good policy in that environment. And that, I thought that was as bad as it could get, but then SOPA made that look like, uh, you know, like, like a Harvard debate. On, uh, I mean, SOPA was so much worse. There was so much uh, distortion on that debate. And so is this sort of what we're going to be looking at? And, and what's your view on that? Is that, uh, I mean, I assume you don't like it, but. Uh, do you think it's okay? It should be people should should there be an effort to sort of ramp this back down and get it more civil, or is it sort of just the way democracy works? I think it's uh, at least at the moment the way our democracy works. There's a lot of that here in Washington uh, and on the campaign trail, and will continue to be. It's, it's an election season. 
seems like it's election season all the time now. Um, and uh, and I, th I think that's unfortunate. I will say that one of the great, what I thought was, was one of the best things that came out of having these so-called closed-door discussions is that in that room there was none of that. Uh, it may have taken a little time, and we met many, many, many times, for a set of people who didn't entirely trust each other, who had very different interests, who viewed the world very, very differently, to really sit down and talk. But we all did. Um, and I think people came out of those conversations uh, taking an extremely different tone than they took going in. Now, there were people who weren't and who didn't change that, and I get that. But, but I, I would hope that some of the same might occur in and around the IP questions uh, that, that are frankly very, very important. I, you know, it's, it's, there again, I wonder how big the difference is between the bid and the ask, at least among the most reasonable people on both sides of that debate. I think almost everybody, just as everybody came to agree that having open an open internet is very, very important, I think m most people, maybe not everyone agrees, that IP theft is a very significant commercial problem for the United States, uh, and that uh, it should be ameliorated. Now, there are differences over methodology about how to do that, but when you're starting from what is largely a shared premise, you ought to be able to have people work together at least on an 80% solution. Uh, sure. and maybe you never get beyond that, but an 80% solution would be off the good. Well, you know, that, that, that raises another question, which is, um, you know, the FCC is really dictated by administrative law rules, and there's certain things you can't talk about, and people you can't talk to, and, yes. you know, and, and, and I, I get that, you know, we want to have, you know, want to be a banana republic, and, 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 but at the same time, it seems like it limits that exactly the kind of process you were talking about, where some of the commissioners can't talk to one another, and, you know, a lot of ways that's how good policy gets formed in, 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 in sort of trusted environments where people can say things without knowing that somebody's going to spin it out on some other way. And, and sort of building that trust and having a dialogue, you know, I think does move you down the field as, as you've found to, to your success. Is, is that something that you see as a structural challenge and is there any way to address that? So it's a balance, right, between uh, it, it, it's sometimes not necessary <laughs> To have really confidential discussions in order to uh, uh, to draw people out in a way uh, that makes progress. At the same time, the value of transparency in government is extremely important as well. And so, uh, especially uh, in an agency where I think, as a historical matter, there's a lot of concern about industry capture, it's difficult to uh, not have the rules in and around transparency. And so, I, I endorse those for that. Reason it, it, it does make it sometimes more difficult, but you know that's kind of the price you pay uh, for having uh, an open an open governmental system. I I do think one of the so I, I I tried to think about this when I came into the agency as an outsider. The ex parte process is an odd process because um, uh, people come in seriatim; they don't come in together very often. So. You hear one side of the issue from one set of people, and they leave, and they file a piece of paper saying what they told you. And the next folks come in, and they talk to you, and they file a piece of paper. That doesn't lend itself to the kind of um, uh, crucible of, of adversarial discussion that really can drive good ideas and problem solve. And uh, to be honest, I, I, I didn't make as much progress as I would have liked in thinking about how to do this more, but I think at the agency, uh, trying to create an environment where it wasn't just everybody sees you individually as opposed to at least some of the time bringing parties in together to force them to confront each other in front of you, uh, that might be a better system. Yeah. So Susan Ness said this to me once, uh, exactly the same point you made, which was that the most valuable things or one of the most valuable processes she found when she was a commissioner was the ability to get people together and have a neutral or really good moderator, facilitator, probe people and get them to really uncover these differences and, and maybe sometimes they're not as big a difference. It, and, and that's rare. That, that's the exception rather than the rule. You know, we're all sending our filings in and you've got a stack on one side and a stack on the other. 
is there any way to get more of that? I mean, it, it, could there be some sort of formalized kind of almost like court system uh, where you, know, you have? I think the informality would be more important, but I think there it's just something that you know the the force of habit drives you to do certain things in a certain way, and maybe you just have to break out of of, of, of some of that. Um, but I also think we can't fool ourselves into thinking if you just stick people in a room, it's necessarily going to solve the problem because a, a lot of things that come before the agency. Uh, uh, do involve sort of just moving money from one person's bucket into another person's and getting them in a room to discuss the fact that I want to have more of the money than you and vice versa uh, is not always going to bear fruit. So I think it's trying to figure out which issues are susceptible to that kind of thing and driving the a little bit different process and and I think I think that is uh, that is doable. Okay. So um, one of the things I think that was you know, it may, maybe the m most unique of, of any sort of three years in the FCC, maybe may, may somewhere in the late 90s, but was the, the sort of explosion of new technologies that you just didn't expect and, and, and couldn't foresee and really nobody could foresee. I'm always reminded of an Alvin Toffler book in 1994 where he predicted that televised shopping was going to be the major killer app. Uh, didn't even mention the internet in 1994. Not criticizing Alvin Toffler per se, but it was hard to even think a year beyond that because no one had invented Netscape. So, do you think the, the, the FCC has the capability, sort of thinking about what are some big transformations that might come about, like over the uh, over the top video or new kinds of wireless, or, and, and if so, is that going to change kind of the things you think you need to be focusing on? I don't know if, uh, if the most important thing is to look in the crystal ball and be really smart about prediction as much as it is to be nimble about recognizing trends and being able to adapt as things change. I mean, the example you gave earlier I think is a good one, which is when we got in there, we, we certainly knew that, that uh, data consumption was growing uh, and you could just chart it out and that how much spectrum we had uh, wasn't going to keep pace. But where exactly the axes were going to cross changed dramatically. There were no tablets when we got spark cord penetration was a fraction uh, of what uh, it is today. Um, and uh, so I don't think the key there was necessarily five years ago being able to foresee tablets. Uh, I think the key is when something does change, uh, to have the right people thinking with the right mindset, drawing upon not just their own expertise but outside expertise to think as quickly and smartly as possible about what's the right, if any, role of government in the changing landscape. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you said, there were, there were a number of things that came up, you know, that uh, we talk, have hit a couple of them. Tablets, the fact that devices have become so very, very important, the incredible importance of Wi-Fi compared to even just a few years ago, um, Usage-based pricing as a as a, something that's going to drive. You, know, you, you talked about about uh, getting those great download speeds uh, on the Wi-Fi, but speed alone is not necessarily going to make uh, the wireless networks a competitor of wired if you have a pricing system that makes the downloading of the kinds of things people want to watch prohibitively expensive compared to wired. So there's all kinds of questions. Uh, about about that, all kinds of new business models and, and, and new technologies that will come up all the time. I think it's one reason, again, why the chairman has emphasized flexibility with respect to the FCC's, both its, authority, its, its, its statutory authority, because in our, at least, I think it's always been true, but it's especially true perhaps right now, legislating change in an area where things move so fast is very, very difficult because on the Hill, it's so much easier to block things than to get things done. Great. So, um, why don't I open it up? We're going to open it up now for, for questions for Eddie, and uh, I've, got, I've got several of those if folks don't have them. Um, but uh, if you just want to raise your hand and identify yourself, and yeah, right here, sir. Yeah. Uh, David Turetsky, Duane LaBeouf. Eddie, I'm just. Hey, how are you, Dave? I'm just curious, um, uh, having been the chief of staff at an important agency. Uh, what, and coming in from California, what surprised you about the agency, uh, pleasantly or unpleasantly? Um, what was different than you expected, either alone or in its interactions with, uh, with others? 
Well, it was all. So if you ask a question that I actually had on my list and didn't ask, you get a bonus point. That's <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you know, as as an outsider to the FCC, uh, almost everything was a surprise. To, to be honest, um, uh, you know, I I was. I came back to Washington once more to be in uh, once once previously to be in government. I, I went to the Supreme Court as a clerk, and uh, I came with a really reverential attitude towards the court. Uh, and I left, as those who read what I've written about the court know, with a somewhat less reverential attitude towards the court. Uh, I think I've had the reverse experience with respect to the agency, which is I came in not knowing very much about it. Uh, I think like a lot of Americans, I at that time associated it with a certain part of Janet Jackson's anatomy. Um, uh, I, um, uh, and when I got here, uh, it's filled with unbelievably dedicated, very knowledgeable, talented public servants uh, who in, you know, basically an apolitical way, try and figure out what the right answer is to things. And of course there's a, an overlay from the eighth floor which, uh, but uh, that was, um, I don't, I, for those who work in and around the agency, I don't think it's a surprise. But for me, coming from the outside, it was a surprise. And then the, the other was just uh, the tremendous pace of change you know, uh, that every, every other week it seemed like there was an issue that no one would have anticipated, you know, whether it's the Comcast decision coming down or whether it's, it's you know, the whole Apple revolution or uh, uh, you know, Netflix or whatever. What, it, it, there, there were so many big things that happened in our space over such a short period of time. And, and well, they, well, not surprise isn't the right word, but it created a change in dynamic and thinking that we had to keep up with all the time. And that, that was a, a very pleasant surprise. Uh, Paul in the back. Hi, uh, Paul Schrader with the American Foundation for the Blind. I just uh, wanted to ask something about the role of the agency with respect to consumer interests. And, and, and it's interesting because you talked about the net neutrality debate in terms of ISPs on one side, sort of the public interest in tech, and you lump them together on, on the other side. And I, what I wanted to ask about is, is can and should the FCC play a more aggressive role on behalf of consumers when it's a pure consumer, if you will, consumer versus industry, issue and, and we face that all the time in the disability community where it's not an alliance with you know uh, one side of a behemoth war but it's really a small relatively un disenfranchised group uh, going up against um, our good friends who are probably most of this room um, where we want them to do things that they're not otherwise going to do in the marketplace and it strikes me that as good as, as, as your chairman is and chairman Bernard was the FCC isn't a particularly strong agency on behalf of consumers in that kind of environment where it really is a horrid mismatch of, of power and structure. Uh, and so should, should something change? Can something change? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I, I think just to the baseline question of is that part of the uh, agency's mission, the answer has to be a resounding yes. It, it, it does have to be. It's not a question of just balancing commercial interests. The public interest is the lodestar of what the commission should be doing, and uh, you know, consumers are an incredibly important part of that. In fact, although it, it, it didn't come up in, in my opening remarks, I think one of the, the most important set of work that the commission's been doing is the implementation of the New Accessibility Act, uh, and uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a new congressional mandate, and one that that uh, where there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, and we brought in to help run that process someone you know from the from the consumer advocate community, um, and uh, and so that's that's an important part of the commission's work. There's other work that that's very important. I mean, um, the transparency issues in and around. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of work on bill shock, the billing, uh, you know, cramming, uh, enforcement uh, enforcement actions. Uh, all of that's very very important consumer oriented work. Uh, and uh, it has to be a part of any any chairman's agenda. Right here, and then here. Hi, Andy. Jonathan Make with Communications yes. Daily. Nice to see you. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, just so everyone can hear, can you just reflect on your biggest hopes and then also your greatest concerns about uh, incentive option results? Well, uh, look, I think in terms of the, the greatest hopes, uh, it would be to reclaim uh, a very, very sizable amount of spectrum. 
uh, and uh, you know, as a result of that, uh, to deliver you know, greater consumer value and innovation uh, over the long run, uh, as the U.S. Uh, you know continues to uh, lead the world in mobile. So that would that would be the, the hope. Uh, uh, I think the fear would be uh, that um, you know, whether due to uh, some of the restrictions on the FCC or for other reasons, uh, the auctions are less successful. Uh, and uh, therefore a lot less uh, uh, public value uh, is achieved and the wireless networks which are going to be choking uh, over time uh, don't see the relief they need. Hi Eddie, Ted Gotch with Telecommunications hey, Reports. Hi. Um, you spoke in the beginning of your intro a little bit about the stages that uh, the FCC has sort of undergone under the chairman and I wondered uh, didn't seem to me you sort of came out and said it, but I was just wondering from your discussions whether from the get-go, the chairman and obviously you and, and those who were, you know, uh, tight in his inner circle saw that there was going to be a need to sort of go through these stages to accomplish what the large goals were for um, the chairman had for the FCC. I mean, did you always see that there were going to be you're saying the, the FCC is entering a third stage now. Was yeah. there always, we're going to spend this time doing this, 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 and that would to get to where I, we want to go? I, I would never pretend to that level of perspicacity. But I do think, just as a general matter, uh, when, when the chairman got in at the end of June 2009, it was apparent, and the work was already actually in its nascent stages, that the country needed a strategic plan for broadband. Congress had authorized the creation of one, but that, you know, there you could have a five-page or a 20-page plan that people stuck in a, in, a, in a drawer someplace and never looked at, or you could take that assignment really, really seriously and create a blueprint for the country. And that's, so, you know, that was a very important initial decision. The team that was brought in to do that did a fantastic job. Uh, and then the natural next step to that is, okay, you have a strategic plan, you're supposed to implement. And uh, stage two uh, has been to, to try and implement uh, you know, the, the, those things that are within the, principally those things within the FCC's control. And, you know, that's Spectrum, USF, uh, things like data roaming and poll attachments, um, the white spaces, etc. cetera. And uh, I, as, as I recall, uh, when, uh, uh, when the plan came out or shortly thereafter, uh, you know, we sort of put out a, it's probably a foolish thing to do, and it was over-optimistic, like all such things are, but we actually tried to put out an implementation timetable. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't meet our temporal goals with respect to, to implementation, but I think if one goes back and looks at that, well, not, you know, a few of the items have kind of uh, been superseded by other events, but a vast majority of the FCC-controlled uh, initiatives uh, from the Broadband Plan uh, are, are either completed or substantially underway, uh, and now, the as I call this next stage, I've obviously made it somewhat artificial, but this working out period uh, is, is uh, okay, you, you decide on a policy, uh, you set up a framework, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's where, where I think we are on a lot of the, on, on many of those issues. Debbie, thank you. Hi, Eddie. Um, Debbie Goldman. The Hi, Debbie. It's great to see you. Great to see you. There's been great work at the commission around the wireless issue. On the, but as you've mentioned, the spectra, the physics of spectrum are such that there's always going to be capacity constraints. And uh, there's been much less focus on getting fiber to the home, not just into the neighborhoods, but to the home, which of course is part of the solution, not only for mobility, but um, lots of other uses. Do you see that there's, what can, what can the commission do in that area? Or is it that you just say, there's so much capital there, we don't regulate, there's nothing we can do? Well, I, I don't think there's, there's, <laughs> there's nothing to be done because I think, uh, first of all, uh, part of the pro-competitive policy uh, leaning is that Getting companies to compete against one another is something that does drive the investment in the networks. Um, uh, there are initiatives out there that have not yet been uh, adopted, but that the chairman has supported, like did once, 
which would lower the costs of investment uh, and therefore uh, allow for greater fiber deployment. Um, there's, um, uh, you know, the USF and ICC reform was designed uh, to have a, a more fair and efficient system, uh, which uh, hopefully will drive additional investment dollars in the networks. So I, I don't, well, it's true that in some ways uh, the wireless issues have become the glamour issues. You're absolutely right to say that there is a lot of nuts and bolts work on, on the wires that are not only essential for wireless co wire connectivity, but for wireless connectivity as well. And so, you know, we live in a world in which most of that investment, almost all of it, is going to come from the private sector. Um, uh, and what we need to try and do is, is have a, uh, a playing field where the incentive structure is right and where there are no artificial barriers to investing in those networks. And that's, you know, that, that's part of the Commission's charter. There's no question about that. I'd also add, Eddie, I think the second challenge you related is, is related to this, which is if <coughs> you're successful on getting those one-third of Americans without connectivity, that it makes the case, the economic the, the case. The network effects will be, right, will drive. Network. Yes, drive. We've got more customers now. That's, that's certainly true. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm a French national resident in Norway. I've been involved uh, heavily in Sweden and Norway for broadband. Two different approaches. In Norway, they try to stimulate local communities to develop applications for broadband, equip the local area with broadband anyway, but they, the central government favored the local development of applications. So they helped define the applications. In Sweden, it was more centralized, building the uh, broadband infrastructure. We don't know which is best today. Uh, what we do know, so I was involved also in Japan with this, what we do know that we need local communities to equip them with the knowledge, not only infrastructure, to develop applications, anticipates technological developments and explosion of applications. My question is, wouldn't it be better to transfer part of a central or federal legislative, legislative process in the United States more to local to states or even smaller local communities? So to empower local communities and then to learn what to legislate or not. Well, uh, of course, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, uh, sadly, is uh, familiar with the the two experiences you describe. But I would say that here, uh, we really rely on private sector development of those applications. Uh, and uh, I think that's been a big success. I, I mean, when I look around at, at now, there's a lot more work to be done, but applications are exploding here in the United States. And I think that that's actually one of the areas in which we're having great success. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the networks to support uh, the applications of the future. And uh, there are uh, a number of new enterprises going on that are very community-centric. Um, one of the predecessors in my job, uh, Blair Levin, is uh, trying to put together something called GigU, which is an, an effort to draw university communities together uh, into what might be called sort of mini ecosystems to drive very, very high-speed broadband and application development. Uh, into uh, those set, those kind of hubs. Um, uh, that's a very interesting project. Uh, uh, Google's out in Kansas City uh, with uh, a high-speed broadband project that I think they will hope will drive uh, new ideas about applications. Um, uh, you know, you've got a lot of money going into health IT, uh, which presumably is going to drive uh, uh, that. You, there's more R and D money uh, now. Uh, being headed, headed in this direction. So uh, the government, while not playing a large role in this, uh, should be in a position to try and facilitate private sector application development, some of which there aren't a lot of barriers to doing that on the local level. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's really a private sector enterprise here. So let me uh, close with just two questions at hand. Sure. The last one's a little bit softball. So, uh, but so give me the hard one first. I'll give you the hard one first. <laughs> well, this is a, a medium ball. Oh, it's not even a hard ball. Um, 
I think one of the things about the chairman's tenure, uh, Chairman Janikowski's tenure, is he's tended to use a, an array of different tools, perhaps that's because some of the, uh, yes. the sort of, uh, traditional tools maybe were not as available to him. But where the FCC is now, how, how do you see that sort of toolbox playing out? Uh, uh, is that sort of something you see going forward in the future, that there's going to be a broader array of tools? But what are the tools you think work best? Are there areas where you don't think you have the right tools in the box that you need? So uh, I, I, would, I would put that a little differently, which isn't, it, it's, not, it's not that uh, the chairman has resorted to uh, non-rulemaking approaches uh, because he doesn't think he has the authority to do rules, although Congress has told us what they have authority to do and not do, but because he actually philosophically is predisposed to think that uh, in certain circumstances uh, you achieve better results in a collaborative way. And so some of the examples of that would be Bill Shock, where um, uh, one approach would be to adopt a set of Bill Shock rules uh, around um, uh, 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 wireless billing, uh, have a challenge in court and have a whole bunch of uncertainty around it. The other is to go to the industry and challenge the industry to step up and do what you would do in the rules uh, on a voluntary basis uh, that you could ultimately enforce. Um, if necessary, um, but uh, which of those creates the greatest certainty and delivers to consumers fastest? The chairman's judgment was that the second course would do that, uh, so that's what he adopted. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know another would be uh, in this connect to compete <coughs> enterprise. Uh, 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 you know, there's no way for it. Uh, the chairman can't order cable to uh, offer 9.99 service to every single child on full school lunch. Uh, the only way to do that is to challenge the industry that we have a national problem, that they have a responsibility for helping to solve, and that it can be done in a way that actually is ultimately accretive to their business. And sure enough, the cable folks stepped up uh, to do that. Um, uh, so there's, you know, the levers, you, you, you have the traditional levers of rulemaking. Um, you uh, have the, uh, the uh, levers around uh, spectrum allocation and management. You have the levers around money, you have principally the USF fund. But I think you know, the fourth piece of that, and a very, very important piece, is uh, a dialogue with the industry where you seek to identify <laughs> problems uh, where, it is, where there are win-wins uh, for solving. And, uh, and, and I think, uh, a, I think he's been a pioneer in that. Not, not that others haven't done stuff in the past, but I think he's really been a champion of that. And second, I think it'll have a lasting impact because if they're successful, and that's the if, as long as people actually come do what they said they're going to do, uh, it's a model for uh, ways for government and industry to work together on important stuff. Great. So um, what did you tell your replacement, Zach uh, Katz, uh, what, what, what pearls of wisdom did you uh, share with him as to what he should avoid and perhaps do? Don't, don't change a thing. <laughs> it's all working for a <laughs> But uh, Give him your email address. Yeah, exactly. No, uh, you know, the, the chairman's incredibly lucky to have that. For those who in the community have worked with him know he has, uh, he's really, really smart, but he also has a temperament that I think is essential to that job, which is even keel. Uh, the hardest thing about being chief of staff is not to get caught up in the wild fluctuations day to day, even hour to hour, uh, over whatever the issue of the moment is. Um, uh, no offense to those who are here, but not to read the trades too closely, uh, uh, and uh, or to read them over the period of time as opposed to look at them only on the day, one day at a time. Uh, and he has that temperament, and I think uh, uh, I basically said, you know, go with your instincts because they're going to be great. Great, great. Well, Eddie, I want, first of all, I want to thank you for, um, I know we, yeah, you have a family and you have kids and, uh, and, a dog. and a dog and the dog eats a lot of dog food and, uh, and, you know, going into government is not something one does for the money, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's a, it's a certainly at that level, it's a sacrifice. You certainly gain other psychological advantages, if you will, of knowing that you served your country. So, uh, anyway, so just, uh, on behalf of me, thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for serving the country. And, uh, I don't know what you're going to do next, and we're all going to wait with bated breath to determine that and, uh, and I look forward to hearing the good news. Well, thank you, Robin. It's, uh, it's lazarus.eddy at gmail.com.
right now. So everybody who's watching on the internet starts sending email right now. So please join me thanking Eddie.